Good evening. Welcome to Port Madison Dialogues Session 2. I'm County Commissioner Charlotte Garrido, and I'm honored to co-moderate this evening with Lisa Jackson. We want to thank you for tuning in this evening to participate. And when we began to discuss the format and content of the dialogues, we had no idea that the response would be so great. I'm delighted that tribal leaders are so generous with their time and wisdom and engaging our community on a valuable path toward knowledge and understanding. And I agree that our best path forward is to learn from others and coordinate our efforts. And we wouldn't be here this evening without the support and commitment of the Suquamish Tribe and the Dispute Resolution Center of Kitsap County. Lisa, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? My name is Lisa Jackson. I am a Suquamish tribal member and um, I have been um, living on the reservation and working with the tribe um, from the very beginning. That is me. Well, thank you very much. So the Port Madison dialogues are built on knowledge and we need to have a foundational understanding of the tribe and hence the four week, four part series. For those who could not attend our dialogue two weeks ago, the focus was on pre-contact history, where and how the Suquamish people lived, Chief Seattle and Chief Kitsap, the signing of the Treaty of Point Elliot. And I so enjoyed Barbara Lawrence's telling of the creation story. In today's session two, we will learn more about how the tribe works. And Lisa, would you like to describe that for us? Yes. So um, tonight we're on session number two about how the tribe works. And because of the tribe's inherit um, rights as the first people of this land and our treaty rights, we exercise sovereignty and self-governance. Um, and we will have three tribal leaders who will share their wisdom about tribal, tribal sovereignty. So we will have Sammy Mabe, who is a member of the Suquamish Tribal Council, a fisherman and a skipper of the Sacred Water Canoe. We also have Tony Forsman, director of Suquamish Seafoods, a former Suquamish tribal leader and a fishing rights warrior for many years. And our third panelist, we have my mom, Tina Jackson, who coordinates the Suquamish tribe's cultural department, which includes coordinating the tribal canoe journey and other tribal events. Uh, she also spends a lot of time supporting and taking care of her family. So we will welcome um, your questions via the Q&A feature on the chat. So we'll get to as many questions at the end as we can. Um, but before we turn it over to our panelists, we have a special performance from Suquamish poet, author of numerous books of poetry, and a frequent performer, Cedar Saigo. Thank you, uh, Lisa. And thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, I'm so uh, proud and honored to be asked to take part in this uh, with my tribe. And I also want to thank particularly uh, Tina Jackson, uh, Katie Avacana, and Sarah Van Gelder for helping to put this together. And um, I'm a poet, uh, I'm an editor, and I'm a teacher. And sometimes I write about visual art. And um, I guess uh, one thing I wanted to say, um, I'm just, I'm gonna read like three short poems and two uh, paragraphs from a recent um, essay about native poetry from this region. But before I do that, I, in thinking about what I wanted to say here, um, something I really wanted to highlight, um, when I think back on growing up, um, in Suquamish, um, on Ditto Lane, in uh, Sackman, this housing project. Um, the one thing that I'm so grateful for is um, 
the exposure, the constant exposure to art that I experienced uh, in the Suquamish community um, before, you know, it continues now, but I really experienced it consistently from when I was a child to when I went away to college at 18. Um, and the older I get, the more I realize that in this country, that's very rare. Often people are discouraged from becoming artists or it's, it's not woven into um, the everyday life that the way it is uh, within Suquamish, Suquamish culture. And I even wrote down a list of all these people, but it would take too much time and it would just be a huge, you know, name drop. But, you know, I experienced storytelling, weaving, beading, singing, dancing, um, painting, poetry, carving. And then of course, when we would do our gatherings, you would see all of these forms of art playing off of each other, um, wearing your beading, um, while you're dancing to the singing and storytelling being a dance. And um, I just think that's such a, it's still so contemporary to put everything into the field and show it off. Um, and so often we're only considered, you know, traditional artists, but really, you know, we're as contemporary as uh, you can get. And um, yeah, I guess I'll go into my, uh, just want to read these two paragraphs from this essay. It's in this new anthology of Native American poetry that I helped co-edit with Joy Harjo, one of my heroes. Native people of the Northwest had no choice but to live in relation to poetry from the very outset of creation. We had to learn to identify and convert the individual elements of earth into forms of protection and sustenance a so-called lifestyle. This would involve courtship and gathering of every necessary berry, moss, bark, and wood. I remember stories of Suquamish women leaving for several days on summer journeys over the Cascade Mountains into Eastern Washington to gather luminous bear grass, those pieces that would sometimes tell stories along the outer surface of our baskets. This draping of my history within the landscape has become an available arc that I tap into at will. And just as we formed a poetry out of our literal surroundings, we then had to move on to preserving these traditions as they were quickly becoming outlawed by the US government. When elements of trauma begin to surface within our histories, the action begins to be told in reverse. To this day, we are still fighting to be seen as living, breathing, contemporary artists. I have come to think of native poets as warrior slash prophets that can move almost routinely beyond our own bodies. We are hovering scribing entities free to drop back into our trenches as needed. It is the poems themselves that provide the bedrock for further resistance and redefinition. Becoming a better listener is also a huge part of becoming a more complete poet to always leave ourselves open to new frequencies. Now the poetry. This poem um, was a poem I wrote because people were always asking really like dense, ignorant questions about what it was like to live on an Indian reservation. So I just wrote this. Um, this poem is 10 years old now, which is kind of weird. Um, things to do in Suquamish. Smoke salmon, call San Francisco, like totally. Get driven to the terminal, escape. Come back after dark and feed the horses. Alfalfa, Timothy, oats, pick their hooves. Visit the Suquamish Museum. The eyes of Chief Seattle are shut, his spirit to himself. Sepia tones, baskets, white hot rocks, cobalt trade beads. Say hi to all my cousins, cul-de-sac. Hi, Josh. Hi, Jeremy. Drink Rainier beer, a ribbon out, up, and over the peak. I confuse it with Mount Fuji. Walk back to dad's room. He talks when he wants and smokes. Linger over his bookshelf. Moby Dick, Starling Street, all of Kurt Vonnegut, try and write the serial killer light at night, see through green and black, give up, try prose. 
And just two more. And this one is from a brand new book that just came out like two days ago. Um, this has a bunch of poems about Suquamish, concerning Suquamish. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. And this one was written about Old Man House. Um, I just sort of walked around and asked myself, like, what did I learn here? And that became the sort of question or the form of the poem. Starting from Old Man House, what did you learn here for Joy Harjo? How to fall asleep easily on the beach, to dig clams, to dream a net made of nettles, a medicine of marsh tea boiled out to the open air, a memory of cedar bark coiled, resting for months in cold water to be fashioned into our so-called lifestyle. Clothes for ceremony as well as daily life, canoe bailers, diapers. We use the wood for our half mile longhouse and totems dried fish, a hard smoke, wooden oval plates that hook together filled with clear oil of salmon to wet our palates and smooth our bodies. A shawl of woolly dog now extinct. They were bred on tiny islands we can still identify. Tatouche Island off of Cape Flattery where there were whaling tribes too, the Macaw, one of whose villages collapsed, preserved in silt, later unearthed, and how else which other ceremonies or necessary edges of objects? Our ivory needles, otter pelts, mat creasers, our dances. What else do you remember dreaming of? A kind of rake to skim the waves, to catch tiny fish on rows of twisted nails. And one more poem. Um, this one was inspired by a beautiful show at the Suquamish Museum. Um, that was curated by Lydia Saigo and um, also Heather Purser. And I sort of stole this title from Heather from the show. Um, it's called We Are the Ancestors. And this is the last poem. Thank you so much. We would still gather faithfully around the last standing beam of Old Man House, 1903, disassembled, barely eyeing the camera in our Victorian collared clothes. One man aside his unicycle, straight-faced, another swinging a bat. Casting edges, the pattern in the shine, it never trails off. When the rock is shaken, rain will fall. We are here and we'll find you. We will comb back through the sky for all traces. Again, it is our pleasure. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Cedar Saigo, for your wonderful poetry. Um, we really re appreciated the reflections of traditional history and um, the beauty of, the, of your poetry. It's now my honor to introduce Sammy Mabe, a tribal council member, a fisherman, and skipper of the Sacred Water Canoe. Sam, Sammy, thank you so much for your gift of your time this evening. And, and you will welcome our three panelists as well. <laughs> thank you, Charlotte. Did you say, I'm sorry, did you say I'm introducing the three panelists as well? Yes, indeed. <laughs> Sorry about okay. that. I was having a little technical errors earlier and uh, didn't get the full briefing of that part. Yeah, next up on our panelists is, is a good friend of mine and has been a mentor over the years, uh, Tony Forsman. He is the head of Suquamish Seafoods Enterprise, does all of our gooey duck and clams and fish processing. And has been on the front lines of treaty right protection for longer than I've been alive and, and has been a great asset and leader to the Suquamish tribe. And then next up we have uh, Tina Jackson, who is our cultural specialist down at the Suquamish tribe. And Tina 
has the unfortunate task every year of trying to keep all the canoe family in line along the canoe journey, which I have my own canoe family as well. And I know that that is the one of the most tedious, unrewarding tasks that you can be tasked with. And but she does a great job at it and then has done a great job at helping, uh, you know, put an emphasis on culture throughout the tribe. Thank you, Sammy. Could you guys hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Can we start with the slides? Next slide. Um, Okay, so we're going to discuss, we did this last week, we discussed, uh, for those of you that were here last week, we discussed um, pre-contact and all the way up to the treaty signing, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this one. Um, the Treaty of Point Elliott, um, which established the Port Madison Indian Reservation where we're at now, um, for giving up all the land, we agreed, um, as long as we're able to hunt, fish, and gather, um, all the materials that we needed for our life, our livelihood and our culture. Uh, we also, um, and then in turn, the government promised us healthcare, education, and protection of our reservation, which we'll probably talk about at a different, a different session. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> um, This one talks more about um, some of the things that pop up, some words that pop up. Um, the, the treaty with the between the United States and the tribes are the same as they would with a foreign nation. If you have a treaty with France or um, Mexico or whoever, it's the same, we're at the same level as that. So you always, you hear the phrase and probably, it's probably more of my generation thing than everybody else's generation below us, but you always hear it takes an act of Congress to, to make something happen. Well, it actually does take an act of Congress to change um, the rights that, tri that tribal people have. Um, and so, and, and even if they try to change it, the Supreme Courts have um, upheld it over and over and over again. Um, and using the term Supreme Law of the Land. So it's the it's one of the top up there with the constitution of the United States. So that allowed tribes to start um, <clears throat> at, at um, I can't remember when it was, the Dawes Act or the, that allowed us to start getting, starting our own governments. Um, but um, the Indian Reorganization Act allowed us to write a constitution. We had been governing ourselves for 15,000 years before this, just, this just made it official. And it um, allowed us to formalize and build government government relations between federal, state, and local agencies um, and throughout our own self-determination. De self um, next slide. Um, Sammy and um, Tony, if at any point you'd like to add anything before moving on, please do so. Okay. Will do. Did you guys want to say anything about sovereignty before we? Move? Well, go ahead, Sammy. Oh, I'll lead off you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, sovereignty is you know by def it, it's our inherent right to govern ourselves. Um, I know one thing that especially with the social media generation, you see a lot of really polite things and a lot of negative things in terms of tribes, Indians, um, treaties. And I think there has been a lack of education in terms, I think Nina or uh, Tina 
hit the nail on the head in one of the slides where where they do reference the U.S. Constitution and the supreme law of the land. And a lot of times non-natives that aren't particularly up to speed on sovereignty don't understand how we get the rights and the privileges that, that we do. And, and it's due to a, an effective peace treaty. And the I, I liked that Tina referenced, you know, treaties that we have with other nations because that that's a that's what the Suquamish tribe is, is we are our own people, we are our own nation. We just happen to be within the boundaries of the United States of America. But we govern ourselves, we have our own police force, we have our own, we're, we're in charge of our own um, criminal justice system, healthcare system, um, all of those things that any other government is tasked with, we have to run that for ourselves. As the US government has been navigating through the, uh, a good example is the pandemic. You know, the US government state governments, local municipalities have been reacting and navigating their go individual governments through a pandemic, just as we are. We, we have to do that on our own. We are very fortunate here in Suquamish and in the Northwest in, in general in most tribes, but particularly Suquamish, we're, we're very blessed to have good partnerships with our neighboring municipalities and are able to work in collaboration with them. But with that being said, we still at the end of the day have the, the right to, to you know, do things as we see fit. Yeah, I think the, you know, the other part um, that, at least in my experience, that um, you know, people don't recognize with the treaty as it relates to jurisdictions and fishing rights and all that, is that the tribes reserve those rights. In other words, um, tribe made an agreement with the United States to basically give up the land they were occupying, you know, for the rights to fish, hunt, govern themselves, um, and all the other things that um, you know it takes to, you know, evolve as a people. So um, they're varying. There are varying degrees of of. Um, uh, sovereignty and how it's uh, the, how it's defined, you know. But the bottom bottom line is the tribes have the right to govern themselves, and just by going, I went through the time when it was really hard at the count at every level um, to um, um, get folks to recognize this, and there were some pretty low times. But I think it just shows the strength of the tribe, and we just worked hard to. Um, get that through, had to go to court at times. Um, but the, the whole time was, um, it was very important to uphold um, our rights to govern ourselves and to resist issues that was going to threaten that. And um, I think it's always an ongoing education. Things are 200% better than they were for sure. Um, but it's an ongoing education um, to get people to understand one another, you know, and how it really works. That's all. Um, it's a good thing. I mean, Tony was there when we had, I mean, as early as early as the as the early 1980s, there was less than 30 tribal employees working for the tribe. And now we are the second or third biggest employer in Kitsap County. Um, we've grown that much in 30 years, which is amazing. And we're very thankful. for. But I did want to point out before we move, before we move to the next slide is this um, old man house um, picture is the one that was one, about one of um, um, Cedar's, Cedar's poems where he talked about, this is the picture that he was talking about. Um, and then from 1905 to 2008, we now have the House of Awakened Culture was out at Alt. Um, where we host our ceremonies again. This was burnt down to um, stop our ceremonies. And by 2008, we were able to build an, a new longhouse and hold our ceremonies there. So 
Um, I just wanted to point that out because Sierra was mentioning it earlier. Uh, next slide. Is Suquamish governments. Um, I think um, Sammy was going to take the lead on this area. What the roles of general council is and the roles of um, tribal council. Yes. Yeah, so are, are you guys hearing me okay out there? I, I keep getting a disclaimer that my internet is unstable and so just want to make sure I'm hearing you loud and clear. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. So in 1965, the Suquamish tribe enacted its formal constitution. And the, essentially the way our government's built up is I'm not going to really stick to the slide a whole lot. Um, it's, it's set up where the general council, which is our, our general membership, all of our tribal members, uh that are over the age of 18 uh they are the ones that that set the ultimate guide and um guidelines for for the tribal council and then in the third weekend of march every year there is elections held and we have a seven member uh tribal council uh a chairman vice chair secretary treasurer and three members at large all on three year staggered terms and it is our role as tribal council members to to basically oversee the government as a whole we we hire executive directors and various department directors to you know run the day-to-day -day operation but it's our job as tribal leaders to listen to the general council, have an ear out for our membership, find out what the membership needs are, find out ways that we can become economically diverse enough to fulfill those needs. It's our job to, um, it's, it's, as a, as a tribal council member, I've, for, after this term, it'll be crazy, it'll be a decade. But from what I've seen in my years is we do everything from the, the broad future planning of the tribe all the way down to the, the tribal member needs a hotel room for the night because they're on really hard times. Um, we're, we're not your, I wouldn't say we're your typical um, local city council type of um, body we we are definitely more hands-on and we're voted in by a very small membership so so we have to be more in touch and more um, accessible to those members because the the voting body is so small you're going to run into everybody on a almost daily or weekly basis uh, but in general we're in charge of the health care of the tribe, the appointment of judges for the justice system. We, we serve as the school board for our uh, tribal uh, state compact school, uh, Chief Kitsap Academy. We're in charge of protecting the treaty rights and, and all of the UNA, usual and accustomed fishing and hunting grounds that, that the tribe has inherited from our ancestors. And then in charge of general economic development for the tribe. Um, we have a lot of um, a lot of entities that are under the tribe. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, Tony Forsman is the, the head of our seafood enterprise, which is an independent enterprise of the tribe. We have Port Madison Enterprise, which consists of the Clearwater Casino, Kayana Lodge, White Horse Golf Course, and various uh, gas stations and retail outlets throughout the reservation. And and seem to be outside the reservation. Um, we also have a Suquamish Evergreen Corporation, which is which is a marijuana corporation that's a subsidiary of the tribe, and and a construction company 
that does a lot of work with the federal government and state government. Uh, we were just recently awarded a five-year jock contract with the U.S. Navy to do a lot of work on the base. So, you know, in general, we we run a government. I guess long story short. And I just, um, it's it's a pretty amazing thing for me to see. Um, you wanted to hear a, a quick story. Um, well, I remember back in the day when um, the tribe was dealing with the BIA um, on getting this constitution together in the mid '60s. You know, at that time, the tribe we didn't have um we didn't have a place really to meet. Um, so everybody met at um, they trade tr council members traded off um, meeting at each other's house, and they would they would rotate you know as needed. I remember going down to Erland's Point and our house and um the hawk's place and you know it went all over and i remember um the bia guys they they show up in black suits and i think from this day on people in black suits you know make me nervous because it just didn't seem like it, something was up you know um just being a little kid and um and there was something up you know um and um, I think we rebounded from that. And um, um, I think we've um, uh, made, made changes and fixes to the you know, original constitutions that make us better govern ourselves. And, um, and just to see what, we, you know, what we've done and um, you know, thinking about it at that time would have just been you know, fantasy world and to see it happen and be part of it, um, it's really cool. But it took a long time. It was a long, long struggle. My, um, I, my dad was telling me that at the end of a general council meeting in the 60s and 70s, they would pass around a hat so everybody could chip in that had extra money to um, pay for the postage fees to send out notice for the next year's meeting. Yeah. We didn't have a place. We didn't have money. We didn't have no. anything. Um, yeah, it was, it was, yeah, I've been very blessed for the work that, uh, people like Tony and, and your, your parents and, and the couple generations before me have left me with such a, a stable, uh, tribe to, to step into this kind of role. Uh, the, I can't imagine I was barely alive in the eighties. So when, when you get, when you guys talk about those times of carrying cell phone or like a box phone as a, a phone that you would plug into someone's house to use for, to, to make important phone calls. I hear those stories and think of how hard um, my elders fought for us to have what, what I've got today has, has been amazing. Um, I did see that there's a couple relevant questions to to this topic in the chat. Um, I seen that there's a couple people that are asking how big our tribe is. Uh, we we fluctuate depending on uh, births and deaths in the year around the 1200 mark. About uh, three quarters of that is in the boundaries uh, in in our immediate service area, which is Kitsap County. Uh, I, I see Lenny Scarin asked if we have adequate access to health care for Suquamish individuals who live off the reservation as well as on. And, and yeah, thanks to our economic development and our, uh, our wellness program, which has helped generate, uh, you know, health care dollars as well. Um, we, we do have a really robust healthcare system for our members that now Tina referenced early in the sovereignty topic about in the treaty about the few things we wanted from the federal government to give this land. We wanted the rights to hunt and fish them in perpetuity. We wanted health care and we wanted education. And to this day, the federal government has underfunded tribal health care. And 
to this day they they still underfund dramatically compared to members per capita we we are severely underfunded from the federal government in terms of that however due to our economic growth and like i mentioned our our wellness center we do have a a really good healthcare system for Suquamish people, including those that live off reservation. And then I seen Aaron Bischoff was asking how the tribes advocate for themselves. Uh, he cited my pandemic comment and how the tribe has had to navigate the challenges. Well, the way we've had to navigate that is through a rock star staff, to be honest. Um, you know, we, due to our being our, due to us being our own government, for example, when vaccine rollouts were happening, you know, we were able to receive vaccines on a more expedited scale than quite a few people. And we were able to get a vast majority of our most vulnerable elders and community members vaccinated quick and not only that be able to share our abundance with like the local north kitsap school district we vaccinated all the teachers before kitsap county had a robe uh, had a big enough pool of vaccines and that that's the kind of good collaboration and advocacy that uh that we've had over the years um, but a lot of that comes through through staff. Like we have a really good emergency operations center that we've hired. We have really bright people that know all the ins and outs of the state, federal, county governments and, and can get out there and find us the, the things that we need. And then at a council level, you know, it requires a lot of trips to go chat with Charlotte. It, it requires a lot of trips to go chat with Derek Kilmer and, you know, our local senators as well as senators in D.C. And, you know, really put the message out of the Suquamish tribe of this is who we are. This is where things are falling short and this is where we feel things need to be corrected. So there's a little bit of mixture between the elected leaders as well as a rock star staff helping. Um, so we will save um, most of the questions for the end, oh, even I know they're super relevant and um, but we want to get through as much as we can and then we'll come back to them at the end. And, um, this, these pictures here are um, to the far to the far left is um, uh, 1970s pictures of tribal council. All the way to the right is today's tribal council. And the other pictures are just um, um, old pictures of Suquamish, um, our youth council um, that we, we, the Suquamish tribe doesn't, the tribal council just doesn't uh, make decisions on their own. We have a youth council that meets and makes recommendations about youth issues to tribal council. Then we also have an elders council that uh, meet on a regular basis and um, make recommendations to tribal council. So we try to give as much access to the tribal membership as possible. And um, and then the other three are Richard Belmont, Wayne George, and Georgia George, who have spent uh, quite a bit of their time helping us build the tribe that we have today. Next slide. Uh, treaty rights, um, like we said earlier, Tony has been, he has been in the forefront of fighting for our rights, of um, being the go-between, which is really super hard, between um, the federal government, the state government, the locals, and um, the tribal membership. So he would get it from all around, but um, he survived and he's He's um, he's done an amazing job for us. So I don't know how, but um, made it. Um, just a little bit of background on me. I was um, fisheries director at Suquamish um, 
from around 1981 to the mid 90s, um, about 16, 17 years. And I moved on there. I was tribal director for two years and left there. And I was um, at the uh, Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission where I did policy analysis for shellfish and wildlife issues. And um, um, now for the, about the past five, six years, I've been um, general managers of our, our seafood enterprise. But um, um, to condense it down a little bit, you know, like maybe a brief history of, of um, uh, the um, Bolt decision. You know, the Bolt decision was, um, was uh, filed in the 1970, a decision rendered by Judge Bolt in 1974, which upheld tribal treaty rights to catch, um, to harvest fish and shellfish, um, up to 50% of the harvestable share in common with the settlers of the area, which was, you know, which was treaty language, you know, that was upheld. Um, that was, um, of course, appealed through the, um, through the courts and in a case called passenger vessel versus Washington, um, it was upheld in the U S Supreme court. Uh, I think in 1979, uh, was it 79, 80, 80, somewhere, somewhere late seventies, early eighties, which I, which I had the great opportunity to go watch the actual oral arguments at the U S Supreme court in DC. Uh, and to this day, I remember that it was really, it was really quite cool. Um, so I think the most important thing that the bolt decision, you know, meant for tribes was their, um, uh, ability to co-manage the resource with the state of Washington uh, more than anything. Um, I think that was one of the most important parts of the case. Um, tribes are able to um, sit as equals with the state and their fisheries um, departments and co-manage the resource um, to the best um, to the best of their abilities. Um, early on, that was really difficult. The state did not did not at all agree with the decision and fought us every step of the way. I mean, they fought everything. Um, we file a regulation, they'd fight it. We try to file a management plan, they'd fight it. We are constantly in court back and forth. Finally, um, some leadership in the state government stood up and said, enough's enough. You know, this is the law of the land, court action's over. You know, we have got for the best, best for our citizens and the resource, we need to sit down and um, work this out, um, which, which they started doing. And I think that pretty much um, to this day um, is, is the way that the tribe work. I'll, I'm sure that I haven't been in it for a while, but I'm sure there's disputes from time to time. But believe me, it's nothing like, it's nothing like it was. And, um, and given the, uh, the state of our resources now, um, that's needed to be done more than ever. Um, just really quickly, the second part of the Bolt decision, um, besides the, um, the environmental phase two decision, which was found in favor of the tribes to protect habitat so fish keep coming back. Uh, the second one was the shellfish case, which is known as the Rafiti decision. Um, it was ultimate, it was um, a part of the original Bolt decision but um, they put it off because salmon was such a big case. They said, well, we'll come back to it later. Well, they came back to it much later. <laughs> um, in the early mid nineties, um, we, we got back to that. And that's really a whole nother story. Um, as far as fishing and shell fishing goes, I think that shell fishing is very, very, very important cultural resource and activity to our tribe. Um, I don't have enough time to tell the stories there that what, what we went through, um, but that was ultimately found in favor of, of the tribes um, also. Um, so um, long battles, um, it, took a, it, took a lot of, it took a lot of political leadership from both sides to stand up and say, we're gonna quit fighting because we're gonna lose everything if we don't. Um, and I always think that was, um, um, you know, a good move on the tribe. And I'm thinking of something that's continuing to happen. You know, our resources are dwindling and, you know, we need to work together as much as we can um, 
you know, on these issues. Um, I'll just go quickly over the pictures. Um, we can spend, there's, you can spend hours. There's whole college courses on just this subject alone. So this could go on and on for a long time, but the pictures real fast are, there's halibut fishing in the left corner. Um, there's tribal members um, digging clams on a beach that the tribe manages. Um, this is one of the things as the cultural specialist where I need to point out. And I have Ed Carrero gathering cedar bark and spruce roots to make baskets, which is part of our treaty rights also is to be able to, to gather those kinds of things for that. There's an old Suquamish fisherman fishing with a net. <clears throat> and then the picture of the two youth are from our Chief Kids of Academy School, middle and high school. And they did a project a few years back where they fished, they went out, they went out fishing, they caught the fish, they brought it back, they cleaned it, they smoked it, they canned it, and then they brought it to the elders as a gift. So um, that farm, that Ocean to Table was an amazing project and um, there's so many people to think about that. But um, I don't know if Sammy wants to say anything about treaty rights before we move on. Um, I'm not sure how many slides are left, but we have about um, 10 minutes or so. Okay. Um, move to the next slide. I think we only have two. No, we are not. Oh, Tony, do you want to talk about the map? Sure. Um, one of the one of the parts of the um, bulk decision was each tribe that was party to the case. Um, had determined um, what their usual and accustomed fishing areas were. In other words, at treaty times, where did um, particular tribes fish? Um, there was it, there was a variety of different um, fisheries, um, diverse the diverse tribes. There were river only tribes. There were marine tribes. There were big tribes or small tribes and. Um, it was a very contentious and continues to be, you know, a contentious issue um, between tribes on um, where we can fish. Um, it's been 50, this case has been going on for 50 years and those issues still are not um, totally resolved. Um, um, the Bolt decision is, I believe the longest running jurisdictional case in the history of the federal court. In other words, a federal court has never maintained jurisdiction over a case this long anywhere in history. So um, it's um, um, still issues that are being, um, I think, um, battled out. Um, this map is a map of the original determination of where Suquamish tribe UNA was. Um, the map is much different now due to um, litigations that happen, has happened since then. Um, so um, that was one of the um, uh, big issues that um, tribes internally have been dealing with. And probably one of the most, probably the most contentious issues, you know, tribes have had amongst themselves, you know, for a long time. Would that be accurate, Sammy? Yes. Sorry. That's <laughs> all right. I am having a little bit of internet issues, so I caught, I'm catching, I am glitching out a teeny bit. I do apologize. That's one thing about where I'm at is I'm not getting very good internet. We're hearing you just fine. Very great, buddy. Okay, uh, let's move on to the last slide, or second to the last slide. And this brings us up to today. And these are the more relevant tribal departments that the Squamish tribe, the general council and the tribal council run. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna um, talk um, real fast about these different departments. Um, there's the Office of the Tribal Council, there's the Office of Tribal Attorney. Really... Um, Sammy was gonna take up administration. Yeah, since we're since I've probably gotten too wordy and we're short on time, I can give a quick 
summary of, of that. So I think one of the big ones that I would like to touch on is the is the administration portion. We've, we've talked a lot about um, tr the treaty protection, um, but the administration department, you know, has the police and court system, emergency management, those big departments in there that we often get a lot of questions on. So it's probably a good time to, to, to talk about the police department, for example. Um, you know, there, there's often questions on what kind of jurisdiction does the tribe have in terms of its police department. And due to a court case that I won't, I won't reference the name of, there, there, is some, there is some law, some case law out there that uh, the tribes did lose jurisdiction over non-native people on the reservation. And more recently, so, so essentially we have jurisdiction criminally over any Native American person on our reservation in the boundaries of the Suquamish Reservation. And we have civil jurisdiction over anybody that resides in the reservation. You can, as a non-native, be sued civilly in tribal court. And there, there's been case law for that as well. Um, more recently, through acts of the federal government with the Violence Against Women Act and some of the provisions that were included in there, there is a, a little carve out of tribal jurisdiction over non-native domestic violence and sexual abuse uh, perpetrators. And so that, that has been a little bit of a godsend in especially in some of the more rural reservations. Uh, and then recently with, with a MOU with Kitsap County that the Suquamish tribe went into back in 20, 17, I believe it was, maybe 2018. Um, we essentially have a MOU with Kitsap County that we can now detain and arrest non-native citizens under the authority of Kitsap County Sheriff's Office and have them transported to Kitsap County Jail uh, under, under the badge of essentially like of Kitsap County Sheriffs. So that ha having that good government to government relationship with Kitsap County has been very helpful in areas like that where it's mutually beneficial um, where our officers used to have to turn away um, non-native perpetrators and non-native criminals and hope that a Kitsap County Sheriff was available to come out uh, now we can arrest them ourselves and book them ourselves. And then that takes some of the workload off of Kitsap County from having to come all the way out and do that for us. So that's a big one I wanted to touch on because I see a lot of those questions pop up often on what is our exact jurisdiction. So in Suquamish, we, our formal jurisdiction is over natives, but but our police can arrest anybody at this point. Now, the rest of it, health and education, we were the first, in education, we were the first tribal state compact school to take place in Washington State. So we are a day school compact, or we are a tribal school compacted with the state. So. So essentially we are in all the same state. We integrate all of our data with the state. So we're all on Skyward. We're, so our kids have all the same access to, to the same education that the, you know, all the state schools have, but we get to add some things that are more culturally appropriate to, to our students and get to teach it in a way that, um, that we wouldn't have been able to, or our students wouldn't have been able to learn at like, let's say North Kitsap. Yeah, we're able to teach kids more the way they want to teach. I have a foster son that went from D's and F's at, at um, 
public school and I moved him to Chief Kids Up Academy and now he's getting all A's and he's currently taking college classes. So um, it's the approach the teachers took that changed his attitude to be able to show his abilities. Um, community development, we run a housing and engineering planning and land use. I was there for about 14 years helping develop that program. Um, um, these are all just the services we pro provide to our tribal members, social services, workforce development. We have a team that is actively looking and trying to make um, entering the workforce easier for um, tribal members that have a hard time. Elder services, um, we provide a lot of services to our elders because they're the ones that got us here <laughs> to this point. Um, child support enforcement, um, tribal child welfare, um, and then um, my department, which is actually just me, um, preservation of the culture, learning, um, learning to make regalia, learning songs and dances, learning to carve canoes, learning to pull canoes, um, uh, learning to make baskets, regalia, um, how to gather them, how to prepare them, how to store them and all that. Uh, cultural gatherings, um, I help coordinate Chief Seattle Days, Tribal Canoe Journey, and spiritual ceremonies for the Squamish tribe. Is there anything you want to add, Tony? Um, no, except um, I think you could do a whole panel on tribal jurisdiction, for sure. So it very interesting, <laughs> and very interesting, um, a very interesting um, history from here. Um, that really things that have gone on here that have impacted the entire nation. So um, we were always at the forefront of that, for better or for worse. <laughs> like Sammy said, we don't want to mention the case. You did have a question about affordable housing. Um, Tina, you mentioned housing. Can, can you talk a little bit about affordable housing provided by the tribe? Um, the Suquamish tribe um, works with the federal government and the state government. Um, we provide um, um, low, between low income to helping tribal members um, obtain loans for houses for themselves. And um, last week we had financial classes where we were teaching um, tribal members how to start saving up and building up their credit so that they'd be eligible for loans to buy their own houses. But we went from um, building family homes from three to five people. We also have our tiny houses point 1.0, which is a shed for people that are just getting out of recovery or need to come back in recovery. We're basically homeless. It has electricity and heat in it. Um, we just opened or just opening housing, um, tiny houses 2.0, which will have a restroom, a small sink, a small fridge and a small thing so people can transition to that next. And then hopefully into family homes, either through our low income housing program or through um, doing loans on their own. Um, did I see something else? We do apply for grants. Um, through the federal government, there's um, the Indian Housing Block Grant, there's Indian Community Development Block Grants and things like that. So um, yeah, housing is pretty cool. Perfect. Thank you to our three panelists for sharing and taking the time to um, present and share this information with us. Um, so we will, Charlotte and I will go through the Q&A um, and just start with the- we'll go to the next slide. Sorry, Lisa. Okay. So did you want me to start or did you want it to start, Lisa? Oh, I think, Tina, are you going to talk about this slide first? This is just the resources that I went through to do this presentation um, where you can look for information. Um, a lot of this information is on the Suquamish Tribe website. The National Congress of American Indians actually got a 52 page booklet that is Indian Country 101 is really good. Um, treaty fishing rights you can see at the Northwest Indian Fishing and Fisheries Commission. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Perfect. 
Okay, so um, our first question comes from Meredith. Um, are there still unfair limits that the U.S. has the supremacy to enforce onto tribal nations? Um, yeah, there's always, I mean, I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd classify unfair. That's, that's a tough one to say. Um, we, there are, like, like Tony said, there are different levels of sovereignty at the end of the day. And we do still have a lot of strings attached to the federal government um, through, you know, IHS funding, through HUD funding, through self-governance funding. Um, we do reference the, U we're one of the few constitutions that actually references the U.S. Constitution in our Constitution, and which actually holds us accountable to the U.S. Constitution as well. So we have to not only follow our own set of rules that we laid out, but we also have to follow the Fed's set of rules. And then um, on bigger criminal stuff, like Tony said, we could get into jurisdiction all day. Um, on bigger criminal stuff, you know, the Feds step in on anything, murder level, um, high level sexual abuse cases, the Feds can step in. There's, there's numerous areas where the federal government can step in but for the most part they try to you know I, I don't think they're looking for more work and they try to you know you know keep a good working relationship with us uh, feed a trust we'll talk a little bit about that feed a trust so there there is a difference in in land, in the in the boundaries of the reservation, we, especially Suquamish, we are very checkerboarded. A lot of our lots in the, you know, early 1900s were sold off to non-native families. And at that point in time, they become fee or county land. So they, they have to pay those regular taxes to, you know, Rob Gelder's crew and charlotte's crew and we um and then there's tribal trust land which is which is land held in trust by the federal government for the suquamish tribe or a or tribal allotees and and that that is but all of it's within the boundaries of our reservation so there is a little bit of difference in land. You could be, you could step in one lot in Suquamish and be on true tribal trust land and then go to the next door neighbor's house and be in a county property. Great, thank you. Uh, what is the role of the BIA now? So BIA, a lot of times is the one like, so they're who we have to go through to get land into trust. So uh, we deal with the BIA a lot on land acquisition and fee to trust applications to, they're the ones that are our bridge between us and the federal government, essentially. Great. And somebody else asked, do you pay federal and state taxes? Yes. We do pay federal and state taxes for, for the most part there. Um, so if, if I have uh, something delivered to my home, I do not have to pay state sales tax on that. If, but I do get a paycheck from the Suquamish tribe. I am also the fitness specialist for the Suquamish tribe. And I pay federal income taxes on every single check. The only exception to that is when a person is working in a natural resource, if, if they are a Suquamish tribal member and are working in a natural resource role, like in terms of um, fisheries or um, DNR. But for the most part, yes, we all pay. There's, I know there's that big myth. I get, I've get, i gotten told that for years. Well, you don't have to pay taxes on anything. I'm like, well, how come I'm paying, how come I'm paying taxes on my land? How come I'm paying taxes on, on all the food I'm buying? How come, well, yeah, I pay all the taxes too. 
Awesome. Um, and then the next question is from Kimberly. She asks if um, are non-native individuals allowed to live on the reservation? Uh, yes, they are. Um, through the, um, like Sammy was mentioning before about uh, feed a trust, some, la some land is owned by non-Indians, some lands owned by Indians or the tribe. Um, so they, um, you can buy a house on the reservation and live on the reservation. Um, you can rent a house from a tribal member on trust land, or you, you can marry a tribal member and live on trust land. So there's a number of different ways. So um, how many, um, does the Department of Natural Resources still exist and who's in charge? Tribal Department of Natural Resources? Yes, it is. It got moved over to... Um, fisheries, right? No, it's over in housing now. Fisheries and, oh, and housing. All together, okay. and, all together in, in protection. Um, Rich Brooks is currently the Director of Natural Resources. Thank you. Okay, um, the next question comes from Pamela. Can one of you speak to the relationship with the tribe and the city of Paulsbo? It's a little touchy. Go ahead, Sammy. Yeah, I guess I'll take that one. Um, <coughs> it, has, I, it has been a strained relationship as of late. Um, I, I would be lying to say otherwise. Um, there are certain things that we still can not uh, help but collaborate on, like environmental concerns, um, which is going to tackle one of the other questions too. Um, you know, shoreline projects, stuff like that. Anything impacting the environment, you know, we still have to to work with them fairly often on. Um, but in terms of government to government dialogue there hasn't been a whole lot lately um we could talk it we could have a whole different that that would be a longer talk but i'll just keep it short and say that the it's been a little strained but hopefully we'll get back to the table again and and sort out some issues over the coming years having a little trouble here getting there was a question back earlier about how has the um oh gosh now i lost it again about the fisheries How do the Puget Sound tribes co-manage the fishing shellfish areas? And that was Helen Jones. Can we tackle that one? Please do. At least how I remember it. <laughs> I haven't been in it for a while. Um, so at least with um, you know with salmon, um, the uh, tribes and the state sit down and they enter into management plans. Um, where they agree there's a big, um, there's a big um, uh, uh, negotiation every year called North of Falcon. Maybe some of you heard, heard about it. It's where tribes in the state sit down and they negotiate how, how much fish they can catch in each one of their areas, how much the sport fishery can catch in each area. Um, it's very, very, very tedious and long drawn out process. I I remember I was I was involved with the very first one and did it for 17 years. And when I left fisheries is one thing I didn't miss. I can tell you that. Um, it was it's it's very, very, very onerous, very, very hard. And um, um, 
tribal and, and state managers really work hard, you know, to put that together. Um, the uh, um, so it's done. It's done. It's done together. It's done in a co-management um, co-manager's way. Um, the second thing is with shellfish. Um, when I was at um, when I was with the Fish Commission and the the uh, Rafiti decision came down, um, affirming all the tribe's rights to um, shellfish, crab, clams, gooey duck, etc. Um, we had to sit down, and if I recall, we had to sit down and do 32 different management plans with the state of Washington that governed. Um, which go governed the fisheries. And along with that, we did, we had to put together what was called the shellfish management plan or shellfish implementation plan, which governed how the fisheries were conducted, both um, state tribal and um, intertribal. Um, so it's a very, it's a very um, um, detailed, tedious process each year um, for, with the tribes in the state. Um, um yeah um i gotta say it's something i don't miss and i have a lot of respect for the folks that um you know are still doing it um it's a, it's a really tough job that's the short version anyway perfect thank you um so this next question i feel like um we as a tribe get pretty often um so this question is from louise is the casino owned by the tribe and are proceeds shared among tribal members? Sammy. I think we lost. I think we lost Sammy. Okay, I'll, uh, so yes. I can probably oh, help you out, Tina. <laughs> hey. Okay. Hi, Jay. Hey. Yeah, so it is owned by the tribe. Again, um, it's um, operated and governed by a uh, um, uh, a PME board that the tribal council appoints. And then that PME board, um, you know, oversees, you know, all the business operations of the tribe. You know, the PME board was established, I guess, let's go way back because, you know, the tribe with its sovereign right, you know, it was very difficult for the tribes to um, get loans, you know, to, to conduct business. So that's, that's the reason why the PME board was established because they did, you know, sign a, a, a limited waiver of sovereign immunity to acquire loans to, to get into business. So, um, you know, a little, little history, you know, about myself is I'm a 43 year employee with the tribal government. Um, I've been elected to tribal council for approximately 20 some years. Um, yeah, and, um, and I've had the opportunity to see the growth of the tribe. You know, I started out as a night watchman in 1977 in the smoke shop, you know, and then, you know, from there, um, the rest is history. Um, and uh, it's been quite an honor to, and I'm pretty proud of, of what we've been able to build um, over those last 40 plus years. And we do distribute. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the PME, um, you know, um, you know, I guess it negotiates. Um, a dollar figure um, on an annual plan um, to get to the tribe. So yes, and it helps with the tribal operations. You know, again, you know, back in the 70s, 80s, you know, the tribal government was so reliant on government grants and contracts, you know, and if you didn't get, and Tony, you remember, you know, if you don't get those, those grants, you know, um, you know, you don't have, you know, money for payroll and uh, things of that nature. So um, it's, it's really nice to be in a position that we're in today that, you know, we're able to give back, um, you know, through our Appendix X program. Um, and that goes to, you know, all nonprofits, um, not all, but as many as we can distribute. Um, you know, if you're a 501c3 uh, organization, um, you know, go to the tribe's website under Suquamish Foundation, and you can apply for funds to help your programs. Yeah, and one other thing I, you know, I just want to add, probably the proudest I am of our enterprises is that it was always run by the tribe. You know, in the early days of gaming and stuff, a lot of tribes jumped into it and got mm -hmm. management companies to come in and run their business. And um, a lot of them got into the trouble. Um, the tribe took a stand from the very beginning that said that these are our businesses, we are going to run them. 
yeah. you know, and we are not going to take money from anybody that's going to get a piece of our, get a piece of our business. Yeah. Right. We had some low times yeah, there, yeah. but we, but we stuck <laughs> to our guns and, you know, there were, there were Las Vegas people coming up to us and mm-hmm. say, we'll bail you out. We go, no, we're fine. Yeah. We'll do it. And um, yeah. that's a thing I'm most proud of with our yeah, enterprise. Absolutely. They're, they're ours. Yeah. They're I, I, I think Skagit Valley, they hired a, a Harris company right. to come in and help them, um, you know, open up their business and build their casino. And then what they were doing is they're sending, you know, all those high rollers from Canada, they were flying down to Vegas to play and, and they were lucky enough to, to get out of the contract, you know, but those are things that, you know, we avoided by, you know, hiring our own, um, you know, general manager and management group. Um, and so, yeah, you're right, Tony. That's great. Perfect. Thank you. So um, Sammy's Wi-Fi crashed, so he apologizes for his technical difficulties, but thank you, Jay Mills, for um, stepping in and answering that question. Um, Let's see. Charlotte, you want to ask the next question? I I do, if I can. Um, this person says um, their topic may be for future sessions, but they're curious to know how tribal feel, members feel about non-tribal members living on the reservation. Um, and for transparency's sake, um, this person uh, says that she is a non-native person currently living in Suquamish. So who would like to address that one first? Well, you know, I, I, I guess that, um you know, um, just the history of, you know, um, you know, the land, you know, being sold off. I mean, it, it, it really hurts. And, and it is a goal of the tribe, you know, with, you know, some of the profits is to buy as much of the reservation back as we can. But, you know, but we're going to have to share, you know, these properties, you know, um, it's not like we can, you know, going to run people off the reservation. Um, there is a group, you know, when the uh, Chief Seattle's gravesite got vandalized, I think it was the Olala um, Neighbors Group. Uh, Tina, do you remember? Yeah, Hope that Hope were uh, Hope non-native Hope friends. Yeah, Co-created by Sarah Van Gelder and Ted George. Yeah, that that bonded and been pulled together and, you know, trying to, to mend, you know, um, you know, uh, the relationship between um, tribal members and non-members. And uh, that group is still, you know, um, you know, involved in um, things that are going on on the reservation. And thanks, Sarah. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, let's see. Um, next question um, is from Martha. Does the tribe have a long range development plan? I guess uh, I think I'd like to say we do, but, um, you know, I've been, you know, really trying to push for, you know, the, the master plan to be um, revisited. It's been, you know, a number of years, um, you know, we've just uh, acquired some land uh, uh, downtown Suquamish that was under a 50 year lease um, that we're slowly trying to, to redevelop and, and make it our, our village. Um, if you see some construction going on um, down there recently, um, we're putting in a medical center um, for members and, um, and non-members. Um, so I think that, um, you know, um, we, we really need to sit down and revisit, um, you know, what, we, what we'd like to see. I think the downtown uh, Suquamish core um, could be redeveloped. Uh, we've acquired, you know, a number of lots um, but again, you know, we need to sit down and look at that master plan, uh, make sure um, that what we do, um, you know, benefits our future generations, you know, and do, and do it right, you know, get the county's permission, right? <laughs> yeah. We're in this together. Yeah. Well, I think, again, the county's working on, you know, some of the sewer systems down, you know, um, mm-hmm. uh, the drainage systems down there. So we appreciate that. Thank you. Well, I, I see that we're moving, uh, getting uh, 
toward the end of our time, but I wanted to jump to um, a question Leslie Marshall asked about how the tribe emergency management relates to the Bainbridge Emergency Management and the Kitsap County Department of Emergency Management. And because we've been talking about uh, COVID uh, quite a lot lately, uh, that is something that our emergency management folks are, um, are looking at. Can you tell us how, how the tribe is addressing that? Or the Yes. I know. I know. Sherry May is really involved in, um, and I think she's even on a, a couple boards in emergency management. So um, her work and her staff have just been instrumental in what you know we, we've been able to do here, you know, in Suquamish. And you know, I think they they do have a, a good uh, working relationship, and they do involve um, you know the tribe. So I don't know if anyone else can elaborate on I can, that. I can elaborate a little bit more. Uh, Sherry Bay, she's a Suquamish tribal member. She's been doing emergency managers for us for over 10 years. Mm -hmm. And she's been building relationships with the county, the states, the feds, um, the different cities and municipalities. And so one, um, I was um, fortunate enough since I don't have a lot of events going on right now because of the pandemic, um, I've been helping out emergency management quite a bit. And um, one of the ways that they've been coordinating together is when PPE, PPE um, personal protection equipment was hard to find, um, they would talk amongst each other. And if somebody had extra of one thing, they would they would give it to one of the other, to the to Bainbridge or Kitsap County or, um, um, the county health department and so we were work we've been all been working together um when we're doing that that's how we ended up um being able to back because we're able to vaccinate over 200 people a day um through ours so. go ahead and put those in the oven and then um, um that's how we end up being able to vaccinate um north kitsap school district because all our kids were going to go back to school and the teachers weren't the teachers and staff weren't vaccinated, so we needed we needed to jump in and help out so that our kids could be safer when they went back to school. Great, thank you. Okay, um, let's see. Next question uh, comes from Lisa. How can non-tribal members support Suquamish tribal sovereignty? I think, um, you know, I think the, the biggest thing is, is, you know, ensuring that the elected officials and the new newly elected officials understand, you know, what treaty rights are, you know, um, I, I really, um, you know, that they are the supreme law of the land. I mean, it, it says that in the treaty and, you know, you know, and they say that every treaty written has been broken. And so I think really understanding, you know, um, you know, what the treaty stands for. And the fact that the tribes, you know, continue to, to, to fight for, um, you know, the right to fish, the right to hunt, but it doesn't do any good if, if you know, all these, you know, cities are, are polluting the waters and with their sewer spills and, and you can't go down to the beach and, and dig clams and the beaches are shut down. And, you know, so it, it's more than, you know, it's, it's, it's all working together to protect the environment. You know, because, you know, um, I think, you know, we all, um, you know, even more so now, um, you know, have to rely on some of the subsistence. You know, I grew up in the in the 70s and, and, you know, I tell you, you know, you know, being a kid running down to the beach and digging a bucket of clams for dinner, that was that was routine. You know, now, and I, and I, I say that there's a a uh, 7-Eleven or a McDonald's or a Burger King on, on every corner, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a wonder why, you know, I'm battling diabetes, you know, but, you know, trying to get back to those traditional foods is, is going to be important. But in order to do that, just like what Tony was saying is, you know, it's getting, um, you know, more and more limited, you know, um, I remember just a couple of years ago, you know, waiting for the fall run of chum salmon, you know, and there were no, salmon to harvest to, to smoke because traditionally that was something that we did every fall you know and tina and lisa you know i think uh, down at finney bay that's where i grew up and you know we would you know f you know fillet out you know 150 200 chum salmon you know and put it in the smokehouse and then we would distribute that to our you know our aunts and uncles and cousins and 
friends and you know neighbors and um and it's getting more and more limited you know in doing that so um yeah yeah education uh, you know is the best way to mm -hmm. get it done and continue to do that and you know champion the environment you know hopefully someday both government and business will understand that um having a clean environment's not bad for business right Mm -hmm. Okay, it's, it's, it's good I, for us. I think that's absolutely true. And I want to slip one last question in. I know we're trying to close up here, but um, I want to just ask the question that uh, not Anonymous asked at seven at this earlier. Are there any environmental education opportunities that the Squamish tribe offers to non-tribal peoples? Yeah, we have positions that are open for environmental biologists. Please apply. <laughs> It's really, you know, I mean, um, you know, we're, you know, it's, it's, you know, the, the industry, you know, and trying to get your, our kids to, to want to, to grow up because see, a lot of our biologists are, are, you know, retiring and we would love to have some of our kids that are, you know, in our schools to, to pick up, you know, um, biology science and, and to fill, you know, some of those positions. So uh, Western yeah. Washington tribes work with a number of different colleges on environmental issues, um, Evergreen State College, mm -hmm. Northwest Indian College, Western Washington, University of Washington, um, and there's lots more. Th those are just the ones off the top of my head that do environment and that the tribes work with and have um, information within um, their courses for that. So, Thank you. And and it is important to note that um, you don't have to be um, a Native American or tribal member to work for the tribal government yep, or any of its entities. Um, anybody can apply. So that's what's really great about um, being able to work with everybody. Mm -hmm. So that was our last question. So I'd like to thank the panelists and um, thank you again, Jay, for jumping yeah. in. Um, thank you to the audience and everybody for joining. Um, and thank you to the um, tech group that did all the background work and um, Kitsap County and everything we did here. Um, and then I will hand it over to Charlotte. Okay, well, I'll start by saying, first of all, I want my sincere thanks to Lisa for co-moderating. You did a fabulous job of just helping us stay um, level throughout the entire evening. So thank you um, for, and thank you uh, for all who attended this evening um, and took away, uh, I hope you're taking something new away. Um, I know I am, uh, for example, um, I love Cedar's poetry um, and learning about a little bit more about sovereignty and tribal history. And I want to continue this conversation. I look forward to this. Um, I, my heartfelt thanks to the Suquamish Tribe and the Dispute Resolution Center um, for, without them, this would not have been possible. And you know that our next session, which is scheduled for October 21st at 6.30, will turn our attention to current issues that are affecting the tribal, tribe and will build on the first two sessions that we've already have. I hope you can join us and thank you to those who've made the commitment to attend all four sessions. You'll be able to experience the cumulative impact of those sessions together. So after history and natural resources and um, ter terrific, terrific presentations um, throughout this whole series, I look forward to the next session. Lisa, did you have anything else you wanted to say? Um, thank you for everybody for joining again, and um, thank you for having me. I enjoyed moderating. Um, it's very, it's a lot of fun, and it's always um, great to, you know, continue to rehear our history and our treaties and all of those, um, everything that, you know, we talk about. And um, thank you to Sarah Van Gelder and um, the rest of the tribal team for getting this information together and, do and um, volunteering your time. Thanks everybody. Thank yeah, you. I enjoyed, I enjoyed it. Good seeing you, Charlotte. It's nice Rob. to see you. see you all next time. Yeah. Okay. Good job, Lisa. Thank you.